right, we're reading Luke 24, verses 13 to 35, as it says, um, page 724 in your Bibles, and it's on the road to Emmaus. It's a nice story. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognising him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he said. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. But what is more, it is the third day since all this took place, and in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus, Jesus acted as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it's nearly evening. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with him, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognised him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them, assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray then. Loving God, thank you for that um, ongoing conversation you have with us, calling us, listening to us, forbearing us, disarming us, ultimately revealing yourself to us and transforming us. Come and do that just a little in this moment. In Jesus' name. Thanks, Helen, for the marvellous reading of the Emmaus Walk story. It has to be one of my favourite passages. It has so many great elements. The power of conversation. What happens to our feelings and our bodies in, in conversation? What happens to our minds? the possibilities of our lives. Um, conversation has to be one of those things that enrich the soul and can thrill, thrill us. Um, it's a marvellous gift of God. I know there's more to life than conversation. I'm very glad that you know, there's someone who can fix my plumbing and um, when it's hot, my air conditioning and my car, but conversation is a gift that we can all enjoy. We can all learn and we can all enter into. And 
it became a bit of a theme for us in uh, Tennant Creek and our ministry there based on this story, Conversations on the Road, Encountering the Risen Christ. So I want to talk about conversation. It also, it's a conversation that comes out of dark place, of despair and uh, disappointment. So I want to touch on that. And then it has the transformation when we encounter uh, Jesus and discover that Jesus was already there. So having told you what I'm going to tell you, um, probably can just sit down. <laughs> But I'll have a go at um, just pondering that a little bit, hopefully not get too bogged down. Just, uh, one of the things you might notice about this story is it's quite long. It's the longest resurrection account that Luke gives, and it's probably as long or longer than all the other accounts um, in uh, the other Gospels too. I didn't check that, but it's certainly the longest one in Luke. And in, our, in my Bible, it's two long paragraphs. Of course, in Greek, they didn't have paragraphs. They saved space and they just, no punctuation, no spaces, just cram all the letters together. But uh, you, get the, you get the idea, it's two, it's a quite a long slab. It's very clever. Luke tells us that he gives an orderly account. He takes material and orders it and, and, and puts it together in such a way to tell the story with great power and um, revelation. And it's so good because in this story of an encounter with, with these two travellers, one of them named Cleopas, we get a recapitulation of what's happened both in the immediate a resurrection story with the women were referred to and the conversation with the other disciples and then the whole ministry of Jesus and and then we get to see that meaning revealed as um, Jesus first of all plays with them and then opens their minds and their hearts Emmaus, we're not sure where it is, and most of the copies of, the, of this story we have say it's 60 stadia, so seven miles, 11 k's. Some say 160 k stadia, so that's a bit less than 30 k's. And in Tennant Creek, we had a water hole which was seven miles, or 10 k's from, from Tennant Creek. And I just imagine walking all the way out of that water hole, having a, having a picnic and then walking all the way back. Um, that's far enough, let alone if it was 30 k's, like the next roadhouse, three ways roadhouse, and all the way back. But this all happened on this, this occasion. I said, they're, they're discussing the deep disappointment of what's just happened. We thought he was the one who was going to bring about the kingdom, they say. And there's that lovely detail where Jesus asks them the question, what things? A short question. And they just stop, completely disarmed. And they stop walking and they look at him. And you know that in conversation where it gets really deep and you stop doing what you're doing and you just, you, you might have seen people walking along and they just stop. Maybe even driving the car, someone pulls over him to continue the conversations. Any other distractions we can't cope with at this moment, this moment is so important. And of course, he's, Jesus is pretending that he doesn't know what things they're talking about. And they say, are you the only one who doesn't know? Well, that verse is a bit hard, is, uh, can be translated in different ways. In the few Bibles it says, are you only a visitor and therefore don't know? Um, another way of saying is, are you the only one who doesn't know these things? Have you been hiding under a rock? And there's a third way of saying, oh, you're travelling by yourself and therefore you don't know. Which is interesting the way communication happens. We're social creatures. But either way, they assume that they know more about this story than he does. 
That's a bit ironic, isn't it? <laughs> and so we get to hear the recapitulation of the story. And then he says, lovingly I imagine, how foolish you are and how slow you are to understand. And then that brilliant little summary, if I can find it. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things, then enter his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scripture. What a great little summary. And then he pretends that he's going on. Uh, this is part of just being polite, that they're, they're offering him hospitality. If, he, if they didn't insist, he would have just gone on and he would have known that you know, hospitality is not actually available tonight. But they've, uh, they said, no, no, you stay with us. It's getting late. So they share a meal. And they offer, you know, they give him a chance to say the grace. And so yeah, you can say, you can give thanks. So he gave thanks, he broke the bread and he gave it to them. And in what he, not in what he said, not in what he looked like, but in what he did, it was recognised that he was the Christ. So obviously that's giving thanks, breaking and giving is an allusion to the Eucharist, to the Holy Communion. Jesus giving of himself. And he disappears. And then I love this bit. They go, oh, <laughs> did not our hearts burn like fire when he talked with us on the road? A little glimpse into conversation where conversations lead to other conversations and recapitulations. It was only in retrospect that they even could name that feeling of heart, their hearts burning like fire. And then they put them into action. Well, let's go back to Jerusalem. Another 11 Ks or 30 Ks, whatever. Let's just go back. And there's no, you know, that journey was... Suddenly they're back in Jerusalem and they say, hey, we've seen the Lord. And the other disciples are saying, well, we have too. And then Jesus is there. And community. Community happens. There's an encouragement to us because life is tragic. Life does have disappointments. But deeply embedded in our story of faith is God with us in disappointment, transforming disappointment. I mean, disappointment, the, the disappointment of the disciples was profound. And it's remarkable how quickly they got it, even though Jesus is saying how foolish you are. But of course, over the millennium before that, God's people had many disappointments. Individuals and individually and collectively, you imagine the disappointment of, of Joseph being sold into slavery and having, after all those dreams, having to work his way up from nothing. There's um, the profound collective disappointment of the exile where First the Northern Kingdom, then the Southern Kingdom were overrun by imperial powers and all of the intelligentsia was taken away to Babylon and Jerusalem was ruined. What do you do about what happens there? You know, the, the, the temple, the centre of our worship, our relationship with God is we can't worship there anymore. So then they had to do some rethinking about God's presence. And it was that time that they started collecting the scriptures together and collecting the stories, reimagining what it was to be God's people. And the prophets before and after the exile wrestling with disappointment, wrestling with those deep questions. So the disciples, it wasn't a new thing, but in a, but in a new and profound way, having, we thought this guy was the one, the Messiah. It's a human thing to run ahead, as it were, to think you've got it sewn up, think you know, when 
actually there's more yet to be revealed. Or perhaps just that understanding. Jesus had said many times that he would suffer and they didn't get it. I had a chat last week, a conversation about when is it the right time to turn the other cheek? And when is that just rubbish, you know? Turn the other cheek, I get hit in the other face, the other side of the face. Sometimes it just seems that violence overcomes any love that uh, is offered. And certainly that would have seemed the case. Jesus has been put on a cross. He said, I love your enemies. And now look, he's dead. He's gone. That was a lot of rubbish. But there's the other irony, is that it looks like evil has the last hand, but no. Goodness and love have the last hand, the resurrection, you know, is, is that. So, I, you know, I'm not, you know, it's a difficult problem to live in this world. But can we see, glimpse, the kingdom dynamic there, the what's, the, what's really powerful, what's really true, and what really endures? So the, um, the third thing I wanted to say was about a way forward, a theological method, to put it in geeky terms, but how do we wrestle with life and understand what, where God is and what God's doing? See, these two disciples were just walking, trying to process what they could as best they could. They allowed a stranger to enter into that conversation. They offered hospitality to a stranger. And they're just perhaps doing the ordinary things that they didn't think was any special, but just being good people. Then they realise that actually they're in the presence of goodness and grace in a way that they couldn't have imagined before. How can we imagine Christ walking with us and helping us to see a new way of looking at our devastations and disappointments? It doesn't happen instantaneously. It happens in community. And that community can be experienced in different ways. But it happens. We can recognise in retrospect that Jesus was there warming our hearts, helping us to understand. This is not the only story where it gives us a glimpse into the, the, the method, the theological method of the early Christians. That they looked back at scripture, they looked at their experience, and they looked to discern what the Spirit was doing in new ways. There's something mystical. Um, there's something very ordinary about giving thanks, breaking, giving. So there's a couple of questions to leave you with. How can you see Christ with you on the road? Talking. How can you see Christ at the end of the day giving of himself again? And how will others see Christ through your actions and through your gift of conversation? Let's pray. Loving God, thank you for this community of people and the community that extends beyond here to gatherings in other places, to people on the road to different places. We thank you that you, as the risen Christ, are available to us by your Spirit.
if we are in a place where we just don't know, it doesn't make sense. Give us hope to hold out. For when comfort will come and clarity and transformation. We thank you for the many times where you picked us up and changed our perspective. Change us again. And may we be excited about the new things that you will do in us, for us, and around us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.